Welcome to Nerd vs. World, episode 46, Gangs of New Nerd. I'm Brendan. And I'm Spindles. And on today's show, we will be covering our thoughts on E3, which is ongoing at the moment. We'll be talking about mole- the molecular board game, Game of Thrones roundup, and anything else we get to, uh, in- including uh, maybe an evisceration of Jurassic World, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that when we get there. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's always time to eviscerate Jurassic World. <laughs> yeah, I wish I didn't have to. <laughs> cool, shall we start with Game of Thrones? I would say yes, as we've, we've finaled out with Game of Thrones, Thrones Season yeah. 5. So yeah, now we're now officially caught up with the books. Yeah. And it's finished with apparently some bits that, that were in the books and some bits that weren't. But I, I, I don't know, I kind of felt like this entire season has been a lead up to a series of cliffhangers. I have not been overly impressed with this season, nope. if I'm honest. No, no, indeed. Well, I think, I, unfortunately, I think I stopped writing my round, my recaps of them about episode four, I think just because other stuff got in the way. But then kind of watching them again, I'm just like, well, actually, really not a lot has occurred. Yeah. I mean, The Hard Home, episode eight, that was, that was great. And the... The White Walkers, mm-hmm. that was everything a season, and an episode nine yeah. episode should have been. Um, but aside from that, I think it's courted controversy too often. And we didn't cover the Sansa issue back from episode six, because I didn't feel overly comfortable talking about yeah. it. Um, but that storyline didn't go anywhere, and in the end it was... Reek that rescued her. Well, or has he? I don't know, because yeah. you know, in all fairness, it just looks like they've plummeted to the death. So I guess we'll find out next yeah. season. Plummet to your death or stay married to Ramsay Bolton, I think. Yeah. Plummet to your death I is think plummeting to your death is the rescued. best option, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, there were some nice kind of offhand deaths, I think, because obviously, you know, Ramsay, the, the, the chick who had a thing for Ramsay, yeah. I can't remember what her name was, she was very hastily <laughs> knocked out of the frame. Yeah. Um, Brienne of Tarth seems to be coming, becoming the queen of the off-screen death. So people she's responsible for killing, we never actually see them die, and they're just left to kind of the imagination as to whether they are dead. So in my mind, the Hound is still kicking around somewhere. Yep, <laughs> he's got to be. He's got to be. I wanted to come and fight his brother. Now that his brother's been reanimated. Uh yes, Mountain Stein. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, I kind of. I, I think I've got a lot of things about where I want to see it go. And much as I've disliked Cersei as a character throughout the entire thing, I just want to see her like go full-on mental and just kill everyone in King's Landing. <laughs> yeah, just like salt the earth. Yeah. yeah. Abs- uh, I, mean, I, I will be very, very unhappy if Lena Headey doesn't win an award for that this year. Well, for the entire thing, not just for the work of Trish. Just, just for her character arc this season has been phenomenal. Yeah, I think there's already calls for her to be up for an Emmy. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the voyage of her from, you know, queen to absolutely broken yeah. has been phenomenal this season, and you know, it it it, it was kind of kept to the her her it, like strength was kept right till the very very end, and then she's I think she still kept quite a lot of it when she was just saying about the uh who she'd slept with and what was going on and she'd kept all that under and you could see it's like i'm not gonna fucking tell him and yeah it was all yeah it was good i was very very impressed with that yeah can you believe there are people online complaining that she used a body double for that scene what yeah twitter trolls are out again because well twitter trolls well yes yeah. um so where are we left now um so a, bu- a, a bunch is, of cliffhangers. Yeah, Tyrion back in charge of yet another city. That Tyrion is, in charge of Marine. Yeah, that is corrupt and riddled. And but he's got Varys, and that that, oh, that that was my happy moment of the episode. Was just Varys strolling yeah. up as if nothing had ever happened. <laughs> Absolute genius. Yeah, no, I, I watched that and I thought if you, I was like, yep, <laughs> that's his that's his duo returned. Yeah, and just yeah, stole the whole show with that scene for me. It was brilliant. So, yeah, what have we got? We've got Tyrion left there. We've got the possible fate of Sansa and Reek. No idea what's going on with them. We've got Arya going blind. Yeah. We've got... 
Daenerys. Daenerys surrounded by Dothraki. But I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure why she dropped her ring or what the significance of that was. I think that ring... Does that identify her as a Targaryen or as... As Drogo's wife. As Khal Drogo's yeah. wife, okay. So I imagine... So that was her Khaleesi ring. Yeah, so I yeah. imagine whoever's in charge of this particular band of Dothraki is not a fan of her former husband. Possibly not. Oh, uh, actually just playing it safe just in case yeah. they're not. Yeah, okay, cool. But yeah, I, I, I love the scene between uh, her and Drogon. It just felt like a mum talking to a sulky teenager. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. You could just see him going, fuck off, mum, I hate you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, like the dragon embodiment of Kevin. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. So yeah, she's there. Uh, and then, yeah, Jon yeah, Snow is... Well, there's the, the yes, Jon Snow... Is bleeding out all over... So okay, what are you landing on dead or not? Not dead. I'm landing on not dead. I I, I think that George R. R. Martin is trolling the world. Yeah. At this dead. point, um, I, I th- think he's I think he's got to the point where he's killed off that many people that they're like, well, it, okay, so he's dead then, and everybody's written him off now, and this will be the surprise that every everybody expects that he's killed him, and this time he hasn't. I think he's gonna turn out to be who Melisandre thought Stannis was. Right. I think she realised that. Because, yeah, I, I was... There was something... In it, there was an alarm bell going off in my head that she was there when it all happened. She's at Castle Black when this is all kicking off after she's skulked away from Stannis. Yeah. So, yeah, in, in my mind, it's, it's the whole blood magic thing. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm very much down on the side that he's not dead. Yeah, I think she's she's going to bring him back. Yeah, I think she, I think her vision, I think what she told Stannis was right, that she saw what was it, Bolton banners in mm-hmm. flames, and herself on the, the battlements of Winterfell, and yeah. but she didn't see anything else. Yeah, I think that's right. She was probably there and will be there. Yeah, but with Jon Snow, with Jon Snow, and with Stannis. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I cannot see how. Jon Snow could be dead after the build-up he's had this season. And also, he's got Targaryen blood. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think everyone's put that together. So I think far. so. I think, yeah. Yeah. And the whole Valerian steel thing yeah. as well. So, yeah. I, I, I would say that's that's where we are. Well, he's probably the only true hero in that entire thing. Yeah, I'd say Tyrion is. Really? Yeah, I'd say he's a hero. Because, uh, I, you know, he got dragged into the whole thing because of his brother. And it was all down to his brother chucking Bran out of a window in episode one that kicked all this off. Yeah. Because he went up to the, the wall and he was fine about it. And, yeah, you know, he, he gets it. He was interested to learn. And then, you know, I, I think he's been very adaptive along the way. And he genuinely just wants to be left alone, I think, and be happy. Yeah, and pretty much everything has happened to him rather than anything else. Fair enough. He does like the horror, though. Well, of course he does, but you know, I I don't think that makes him any less of a hero. Okay, maybe hero is the wrong word, but like wholly pure and good character. Then okay, well, he's definitely not a wholly pure, pure and good <laughs> good no. character. But I think Jon Snow probably is. Yeah, I think he is. I think he's the only one. Mm. Maybe Samuel Tally. Maybe, uh, yeah, Samuel definitely. I think now that he's he's buggered off to be a maester and he'll come back chucking fireballs and stuff, I think he's going to be awesome. Yeah, he's just going to come back and he's just going to go I'm Samuel fucking hard. He's just going to blow shit up. He's going to be awesome. Uh, but yeah, I I'm trying to think. Of, well, there's Arya. Arya is a weird one. Because I really wasn't sure where, the, where she was going with this whole house of black and white thing. And I'm really still not sure. And the other pure one, of course, is Bran. Okay, yeah. He wasn't in this season at he all. He wasn't in this season at all. But he's going to come back being kick-ass as well. Yeah. Like hordes of wolves and eagles and things. Oh, and we'll see. Possibly skeletons. I don't know. don't know. I mean, the, I think in the, in the books, I mean, I haven't read them. I don't like know what people have mentioned about his storyline, but he goes off and 
Well, that's it. we're at the we got yeah. to the end of Brand's storyline last season. Apparently, that's no, all that people he, know. He wanders off into the um, outside of the wall, and he finds the man of the black hands. Yeah, and that's that's where we left him. Did we? Did we get that far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He found the tree, and he went into the tree with Hodor and and Rickon. Gotta be honest, his storyline was so boring. I probably just. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't making me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he made it all the way to I'm the tree, and then and the guy in the tree was like, "Ah, oh, you're here. Cool, awesome. Now, uh, now, young Padawan, you shall learn." Right. And I'm gonna take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm gonna take your word for it. Uh, well, was there any other stories that got to any other people? Uh, well, yeah, there was the uh, right, the that... sand snakes getting their revenge, yeah. which is all a bit harsh. Yeah. That's, Just, not, that's not going to end well. No. No, it really isn't. But I, I guess, you know, the thing is, is he going to go all the way back to King's Landing and then try and come back in force or is he just going to turn around with him and Bronn and go and hack some shit up? I don't know. <laughs> just have to wait and see, I guess. Is he going to want to go back to King's Landing and tell, and, and, and tell, tell Cersei? So, t- tell Cersei, sorry, yeah. Yeah, tell Cersei that her daughter's dead. Yeah. Probably not. So yeah, he's probably going to return with Bronn and the cover of dark and yeah, and kill some kill things. some people. Yeah, for sure. Um, who else? Is that all the stories? Covered? I think that that's pretty much everyone for now. I mean, there's quite a few people who've just kind of been ignored. Well, as I said, there's the unfortunate Brienne of Tarth. Yeah, <laughs> still just wandering around with Podrick, and I've no idea where she's going to go now because you know she waited and waited and waited for the sign from Sansa and it appeared just as she'd fucked off. It's like, Dramatic irony. It just appears to be Brienne of Tarth's thing. It's just missing people. It's like uh, she's there with Podrick and they're talking and Sansa Stark just wanders past with Littlefinger. And my Littlefinger, we haven't seen him since for the last couple of episodes. That's true. He's disappeared somewhere. Hmm. Well, we'll see where we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm interested. Yeah, I, I want to see where it's going to go now. I'm kind of half tempted to go back and read the books now that we've caught up, just to kind of see, because I wanted to watch the TV series without knowing. Oh, fair enough. And now that the TV series has effectively caught up, I'd be interested to go back and read it and see what the differences were. Yeah. I don't know whether I'll have the time to do it or not, but it's kind of, it's one of those things. It's one of those things, isn't it? You just look at your reading list and it's like... Already 30 books deep. Yeah. Had you had five more to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. It's certainly with the, with the books as well, because there's a, I think there's a prequel book due out in October. So we found the time to write a prequel book, which is, I think it's the backstory of Aegon Targaryen, which is due out October this year, I think. As nice as that would be, it would just be even better if he just finished the books he's got to write first. Yeah, yeah, true. But hey, George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. No, he's not. <laughs> He'll kill whoever he wants to kill. He'll write when he wants to write. But he has told the producers of the show where he thinks the story will yeah, go. Yeah, which is why I think this season has been very, very different to the others. Because I think they must have had the conversation just preceding this series. And then they've spent this series just moving all the pieces around yeah. into the correct places to move on. And they've dispensed with storylines that weren't going anywhere, moved people around to where they should be. Yep. And next season, it will move towards what the conclusion is. Yeah. No. It'll be fun to watch. <clears throat> it and will. It'll be, it'll be nice to not see a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed full of butthurt book readers. Well, there'll be no, yeah, there'll be no <laughs> book versus TV anymore, yeah. you know? It, it will just be a new thing. And I guess, I, I don't know, it'll be interesting... To see the tables turned if there are people who read the books but don't watch the TV show. So you'll have people who watch the TV show giving spoilers to the people who read the books. Ah, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah? Because yeah. it, it was something interesting that I read today was from somebody who'd, who'd read the books and was just like, you know, we've, we've had five years worth of spoilers and we've kept our mouths shut, so how's that going to play out? What, well, in... The- this day and age <laughs> very badly i would have thought yeah, yeah i think so so i guess watching the social media reaction for me is kind of just as interesting as watching the show yeah cool well that's going to be october i'm guessing uh no it'll be next may really so, yeah next may game through well next march sorry 
It's March. Okay. Yeah, next March. It's yeah, Game of Thrones is, is spring. It's a, oh yeah, it is. Because it's only ten episodes, so it, it runs two and a half weeks. So two and a half months. Okay. Sorry, not two and a half weeks. <laughs> Although when you binge watch, you can watch it in less time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that's Game of Thrones. A bit of Jurassic World then. Jurassic World. <laughs> okay, I knew you couldn't resist. Yeah, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> okay, so just before we start, I just want to say that I back in 1993, I saw the first Jurassic Park film four times at the cinema, and for a socially awkward kid from Droid, which I had to travel on a bus to get to the closest cinema, that was a that's big pretty deal. pretty hardcore. Um, in fact, one of those tickets I won in a Jurassic Park competition for naming all the dinosaurs in a dinosaur silhouette picture. Most of which weren't actually in the film. I was just a dinosaur nerd. So oh, I knew. Oh, they, hey, <laughs> absolutely fine, sir. I loved that movie. Um, I even loved the second one. Not so much the third. And when I saw the trailer for Jurassic World and I saw Chris Pratt on a motorbike with Velociraptors, my instinct was, fuck, this looks cool. And I really hoped it would be. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to love this film. And I'm not sure I even liked it. Okay. I think it is just deeply flawed movie on so many levels and people I know have said similar things but they said that they've enjoyed it anyway mm-hmm. and I couldn't look past the flaws enough to enjoy the film okay I'll give us the flaws then sir well the flaws are I think ultimately this film might turn out to be one of the most sexist movies of the year Ooh, okay um, they're either making the characters archetypally male as like a pastiche of the 80s action hero. And I imagine if you were to view this film under the cultural lens of masculinity rather than feminism or anything else, it might shape out that way. Okay. But it wouldn't improve the film. The principal female lead is Bryce Dallas Howard as the sort of scientist business exec Mm -hmm. leader who has a sudden character turn halfway through where she becomes badass and kicks ass with a gun. Okay. But she literally runs away from the T-Rex in high heels. Okay. And you're at that point, it's like, whoa, this is ridiculous. Um, and the audience POV characters principally are the two young boys in it, the two brothers. Mm-hmm. One of which has got no interest in dinosaurs, no desire to be there at all. In fact, brings no skills apart from brooding, sulking, teenage archetype number one. Okay. Like, Lex in the first one wasn't a massive dinosaur fan, but she was keen to be there and she was excited. Mm. And the overall problem with the film is none of the characters seem to be excited about dinosaurs. In fact, the premise of it being the Indominus Rex or the the I Rex uh, having to be created because people are bored of dinosaurs kind of tells you everything you need to know about the film. No one seems to be up for it. And as okay. and as a an audience member going in to watch a dinosaur film, where you should be. Going, oh, holy shit, it's dinosaurs. Everything should be new and mm. amazing. Like to have hardly any of the characters sharing that sense of inc- excitement with you and dragging you into the film kind of sucks all the life out of it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, then there's the continuity issue and the problem of Doctor Wu, who's the one survivor from the first Jurassic Park film. Mm-hmm. And you'd have thought he'd have learnt his lesson of well, yeah. fucking with dinosaur <laughs> DNA. But he turns out to be the secret villain in this piece. He's involved in a plot with Vincent D'Onofrio's sort of military exec to breed raptors for the army. Okay. To send raptors in to insurgent camps and kill them. So yeah, that's the next Jurassic World. That's That's going to be the sequel. That's pretty much where it ends with them flying off with embryos to go and make a dinosaur army. Okay. Yeah. This is how ridiculous this film gets in places. So in, in terms of the continuity of the Jurassic Park films does it follow through? Cause I, I, I can't get a sense because I, I haven't seen it but I can't get the sense of whether it's a reboot or a remake. No or it's, a... About tw- it's about 20 years on from the first Jurassic Park. Right. So the, the incidents of the first film are mentioned. What about the other two? No, there's no mention of the T-Rex loose on mainland America. Okay. So it's just the first one. It's all John John Hammond's idea, his his vision. And it's kind of been realised in a way. He does have this sort of theme park, although it's less nature reserve safari park and more sort of water world, sea world attraction type thing. Right, yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah, that's referenced. And it's even referenced in the film with one of the sort of secondary characters who wears an old Jurassic Park t-shirt right. talking about how legit John Hammond's vision was compared to this, mm-hmm. where, well, aside from himself, really, no one cares about dinosaurs anymore. It's all about marketing. I mean, Indominus Rex is the Verizon-sponsored Indominus Rex. It's all about trying to get deals. It's either a really clever sort of satire of consumer culture, mm-hmm. um, but because of its flaws, you can't really tell whether that's deliberate or whether they're falling into that sort of storytelling idea. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, wasn't a fan. I mean, no. I, I was deeply disappointed. I mean, there's, there's no prolonged tension. There's no action scenes of note. I mean, they're there, but they're just over so quick. If you think about the first one, you think about the T-Rex, the whole sequence leading to the T-Rex attacking the Jeep. Yeah. And then everything following It was the build-up of tension. And, yeah. Yeah. Because suddenly they were in the car, they were stranded, and then there was the T-Rex actual attack itself, which seemed to go on for ages. Mm-hmm. The rescue from the T-Rex, how Ian Malcolm gets injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then sort of the Jeep down the side of the ravine. Yeah, yeah. That entire set piece went on for... Maybe 20 minutes or so. Yeah, yeah. There is nothing in this film prolonged to that level. Um, which is a shame. And there's also... The, you know, <coughs> it just adds to the general feel that there's there's no risk. Because there's so many characters. Yeah. There's, well, there's a theme park full of them when it all happens. They're all faceless red shirts. Mm. You know? The, the principal cast survive pretty much intact. And you don't care enough about the bad guy to go to be impacted by his inevitable death. It's just like, oh, he died. Well, could have seen that coming. If yeah. I cared about the character a little more, maybe it would have more impact. But now, I, just I, didn't. A couple of things that I that I've heard have been centered around um, characters. So, uh, what's his name that played Star Lord? Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. Yeah. So him as a, a as a character, I, I've heard is basically Star Lord with dinosaurs. Um, I think Movie Bob says it best. He's basically a collection of Chuck Norris facts sort of been put into a body. Okay. He's actually the best thing about the film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah, he's um, a badass survivalist who like works on a motorbike outside his sort of trailer home in the middle of the park. And <laughs> Yeah, no, and he, yeah, literally every Chuck Norris fact rolled into one living body. But yeah, best thing about the film. Okay. Because he engages with the dinosaurs. He kind of, he gets them. He's, yeah, he might not be as excited about dinosaurs as Timmy, little Timmy Mazzello, uh Tim was from the first one. Joseph Mazzello was the actor. Um, but he respects them. Mm-hmm. And he's at least interested in them enough for you to be interested in them. Right. But there's no sense of excitement. From any other characters. Okay, and, and, and the other criticism that uh, that I've seen levelled at it is that if you're going to make something that is purported to be bigger and scarier than a T Rex, actually make it bigger, bigger and scarier than a T Rex. Yeah, that the actual monster itself wasn't any bigger, and something about weird stealth technology. This is where the consistencies and sort of the plot holes start to form their sort of raise their head so to speak is like we know that Dr. Wu knows what can go wrong if you start fucking with genetics and modification Mm. and he fails to mention that he put cuttlefish DNA into the Indominus Rex so it can camouflage and also there's frog DNA in there so it can control its body temperature you know and do what they did in the first one which was allow them to self-replicate um, that was, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the big mistake they made in the first film. Yeah, some, some species can switch, switch genders. Switch genders, yeah. But yeah, no, so they, they track them all by heat vision, and of course they've got this, Indominus Rex has got this ability to mask its heat signature. Yeah. So I don't stealth know. dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. But then they just, they just throw wave after wave of, like, souped up in-gen personnel in combat gear to bring it in it's just like we don't meet these characters we know, mm. we're not introduced to them 
first time we see them, they're going. They're thrown at a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. Just like bye bye human fodder. Yeah, fair enough. So you you just can't get invested in the characters. You can't get invested in the action. You just don't feel any tension when the film ends. You just like you don't feel like you've survived anything. You just mm. like well that's that then. Fair enough. So, so avoid then. Yeah, avoid. <laughs> Definitely avoid. Um, I know there are people who say that you can enjoy it for what it is anyway, and if you strip away the Jurassic Park theme and have it as a dinosaur or a monster film, you might find some enjoyment in there, but... But if you have to go to those lengths to enjoy it, then it's yeah, probably it's not, not a great it. thing in the first you, you place. You might as well just go and watch... If you're after a monster film, go and watch Godzilla. Yeah, absolutely. You, know? yeah. you, go, you go and watch Jurassic Park to be excited about dinosaurs. Mm. And turning a Turning the raptors into the fucking hero of the film. It's just, ah, oh, it's just the worst. <laughs> yeah. Like, in the, in the, oh, yeah, it's just the worst because, like, Blue is the runt of the litter and he fucking saves the day, doesn't he? Because the T Rex gets his ass kicked by the Indominus Rex. So they, they literally replay the finale of the first one, mm-hmm. but with a T Rex and a raptor fighting the Indominus Rex rather than the T Rex fighting lots of raptors. raptors. Mm. But the raptors were, <coughs> the raptors were just a, a a perfect monster for this film. The T Rex was always going to be the character, you, you, the, the sort of anti-hero was just doing its thing. It's just a monster. The raptors were intelligent, so like that showed for, malice of forethought in their actions. Mm. And the way the first film opens with the cage and the man being dragged into it, you're instantly on edge. You're instantly wondering what was going on. Whereas in this one, it's just like two little eggs cracking and it's always a date and then it goes to uh, just a normal family scene with two kids being packed up for a holiday and then it comes back later on that obviously those parents are getting divorced and much of this entire first 50 minutes is just all about how these kids are dealing with their parents possibly separating and you're thinking no you're in a fucking dinosaur park <laughs> you know <laughs> sorry I'm nodding off with the backstory already <laughs> yeah so it's just like yeah it doesn't get it it just doesn't seem to get it, which is sad. But hey, oh I, th- well. I thought if any film, if any franchise reboot was going to disappoint me this year, it'd be Terminator Genesis. I didn't think it'd be this one. Okay, well, there's still time to see <laughs> oh, whether yeah, Terminator Genesis time. is going to disappoint you anymore. <laughs> I mean, it probably will, but <laughs> we'll see. And that's really weird because I haven't actually bagged on a film for quite a while. Hmm. I've actually trashed a film for ages. No, no. I've, I've had a very good experience at the cinema recently. So cool. Right. Okay. Let's On to something a bit better. Oh, my soapbox. <laughs> um, and stuff we're excited about now. Yeah. Well, should we talk about Molecular? Oh, thank God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about Molecular we talk about it, yeah. by ITB Games, which is a chemistry based, tile based board game that we had the great pleasure of. Playtesting last week. With it's a, pretty awesome. With a pharmaco- pharmacokineticist. Yeah. Yes. I looked that up just to make sure it was the right <laughs> way of pronouncing it. Yeah. My advice don't, don't. play it with a pharmacokineticist. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome game. I really enjoyed it because it's, it, it, it's kind of a tile based game that you put things together and build your own. You kind of build the, the board as you're going along uh, in order to create chemicals and molecules using the various bonds and stuff and carbons and hydrocarbons yeah. and it's kind of it, it's really kind of a cool idea yeah and it worked really well i felt you have the recipe cards that you can build towards and you can cash them in for points uh the thing i re- the thing i liked about it as well was the the grid they had for game length yeah so you can kind of set your own parameters i mean we played two games that were meant to be 10 minutes, 10 minutes in length and we played for vastly longer. I think the first one was about an, an hour, hour and, and a half. bit. Yeah. About an hour and a half. The second one was about 40. 45 minutes, yeah. I think. But I think that's because we were mostly laughing at all the chemistry-related in-jokes. That and, yeah, there, there, was, there was a lot of damn you Sproston being shouted yeah. as the game <laughs> went on. So it's been kick-started at the end of this month. Um, I think we should do a, a little video demo of it, a 10 Absolutely. minute, 10 minute yeah, video yeah, through, happy to do that. which would be pretty cool um, we'll put the sh- put the um, information to the Twitter for ITB board games in the show notes obviously you can go and check them out and yeah, 
look forward to this when it gets launched. Yeah, it, it's it's a fun game that you can sit and yeah drink beer and play because you can actually make alcohol. Yep, that's part of the game, which is kind of cool. Or you can just like be an actual wild card and just keep playing for events. Yeah, the, the it it has that kind of random board exploding thing yeah. where you can just play event cards and you have things like lab fires and all sorts of stuff going on that destroy all the molecules in play. And there's different ways to win. I mean, you score points for um, the bonds that you create with each tile that you place. You mm-hmm. score points for the recipes that you you finish. Yep. And yeah. So but you know, my advice is have a lot of dice on standby. Yeah, you want to you want to mark <laughs> off where your points tally is. You want to mark off the decreasing point value of the recipes that get scored and played. So I, I I would recommend a fuck ton of D10. Yeah. <laughs> D10. Yeah. Percentile D10 as well. Yeah, percent. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, percentile D10 because then, uh, I think the game we were playing was first to twenty points. So, yeah. So we were lucky with D20s. Uh, yeah, D20s were all right, but I think a lot of the games. They, uh, what they got to like 80 or 100 yeah. points so yeah I think percentile D10s have a lot of them on standby I think the only suggestions we had for the game were colour coding the tiles yeah yeah colour coding the, the, the which is hydrogen which is carbon so forth to make them yeah. easily recognisable and then there were a couple of things like hexane uh, there was a card that was yeah there's there. some, there some just some printing errors I think between the card and the recipe yeah and well and, and the rules because this is where they're having the pharmacokineticist was like no did, did carbon chains and that's called hexane that means i can have up to six and we're like but on the card it only says you can have four it's like but it says hexane <laughs> okay yeah so yeah <laughs> that was <laughs> that, that's some feedback for the developers there to have a look at <laughs> but yeah it's, it was it was fun and it's I think with more games, I think you'll start to learn the meta game to it as well. Yeah. I think there's, yeah. You got to be careful what you play because obviously you're trying to build towards a particular recipe and trying to stop other people building towards their recipe. But given well. that you can only do one thing a turn, yeah, you kind of yeah. Uh, unless you do what Brendan did, which is try and game the system by playing all the random cards. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He was so trying to game the system. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Every turn, just play one. Uh, ended up like having two or three two or three goes in a round and then sitting out for a, for a turn but totally worth it <laughs> I think I caused a couple of lab fires that's fine <laughs> but yeah it's an interesting game yeah it's cool so yeah check it out well worth it E3 E3 <laughs> okay so I was up to the wee small hours of the morning the other day uh, catching up with Bethesda's first ever E3 press conference because I was just massively excited for any Fallout 4 news mm-hmm. and was not disappointed. Mm. It looks awesome. Um, I'm loving everything about it. I'm loving how intuitive it feels, sort of the contextual base command system, um, the dynamic environments, the fact that you can stick to Bethesda's principle of play however you want to play. Mm-hmm. So you can go off and you can do the main quest, you can do all the side quests if you want to, or you can just, fuck it, stay where you are and build your own settlement mm-hmm. and defend it, which I thought was awesome. So now everything in the game has a purpose or can be destroyed yep. for a purpose, which I thought was great. And it looks so pretty. And it looks huge. And it, yeah, some of those big cities just make Megaton look like an afterthought. Yeah, it's going to be incredible to play. I like the idea. I'm not sure what's going to happen in the vault. They kept that a mystery mm-hmm. from Please Buy, but yeah. So you start off pre war and then you start the game proper sort of 200 years later. Yes. Which ties it into the same timeline as Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how that plays out. Well, yeah, yeah, it, it it did look pretty awesome. When when is that one due? That is out on November the tenth of this November, year. So it's, it's oh God, the end of this year is going to be awesome. Yeah, games. It's going to be silly, silly awesome for games in November. Yeah, this Christmas is going to be yeah expensive. Expensive. <laughs> well, I've got to buy a, I've got to buy a PS4 just to play. Like yeah. this. Yeah. So there was more stuff on that. Um, at the Microsoft conference, but we can deal with that in a second. Yeah, I was gonna, oh yeah there's Elder Scrolls Online, which is already out, but they, yeah. they showed some bits from it. I've, I love Skyrim. 
Yep. Absolutely love Skyrim. But I'm not convinced by Elder Scrolls Online. I've played it. I was in the beta test for Elder Scrolls Online and I've played it on Mac. And I can remember a conversation I had with my friends back in Worcester around the roleplay table many, many years ago where we we were loving the potential idea of an MMO version mm. of, of Morrowind at the time. We yeah, felt yeah, that yeah. Morrowind would be incredible as an, as an online roleplay game. Um, but I think the majority of us have all played Elder Scrolls Online and have all just stepped away from yeah. Elder Scrolls Online. Yeah, I just... I, I don't know, I'd, I'd like it as, uh, as the kind of first... Well, the, the, the one player go around, do things at your own pace. Uh, and I don't kind of want other people butting in and trolling that. Yeah, no. <laughs> the thing I love about the, the Elder Scrolls games is they're immersive. Yeah. And they're immersive because I don't have to deal with... Yeah, other people. Other people. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's kind of my yeah. thoughts on it. So yeah, I yeah. Much as it looks amazing, I'm just like and it does. I mean, when you play it, it does look amazing. Yeah. but it's not the play experience that I want from an Elder Scrolls game. No. So. No, I just I just want a single player version of that, please. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not getting that. No. What we are getting is an Elder Scrolls uh, inspired CCG. Yes. Incredible card game. And that which isn't the only one coming out this year. I mean, there's, there's, I think there's a Star Wars CCG as well, mm. which they didn't call Darth Stone, which they should have. It's an opportunity missed. Yes. Um, and then Doom from yeah. Bethesda. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that looks well. That looks like Doom. It does look like Doom. <laughs> that's, that's probably one of the most violent and graphic playthroughs I think I've ever seen. And it was nice that it was in-game footage rather than... Yeah, rather than... Rather than yeah, quick-time events. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was quite a lot of QTEs this time around. Mm. But yeah. So yeah, Bethesda, their first press conference lived up to all my expectations. Yeah, yeah. But they could have done anything. but Because Fallout 4 was essentially like a mic drop. Yeah. And walk off a stage. Yeah. Yeah. So then the next one up was the Microsoft press conference mm. where more Fallout 4 stuff was revealed. There's more game gameplay footage and they revealed that they would be um, making Fallout 4 on the Xbox One compatible with the PC modding community. Mm, so okay. if you had any PC-based mods, you could download them to your Xbox One version. Interesting. And Fallout 3 was going to be included in the Fallout 4 package right cool yeah because there was about the backwards yeah. compatibility of the expo that was kind of the, that was the big take home from the microsoft conference was backwards compatibility mm. so a limited number of titles at the moment but essentially it'll, it'll get to a point where you can put in an old 360 disc in the xbox one it'll recognize the content and you can download it yeah um but there was so much from the microsoft conference um halo 5 multiplayer mm. looks huge uh, the, the maps are four times as big as any of the maps available at the moment. They're mixing PvP and PvE into their multiplayer campaigns mm -hmm. and online game. And then there was the fact that they've got the steel now with Valve VR as well as Oculus Rift. Mm. And that every Oculus headset now will ship with an Xbox One controller. So they're really pushing... For the sort of next next gen thing of, of VR, and yeah. from that as well is there you know including that with the Minecraft that they took over to get the Hololens. The Hololens that yeah. was just awesome. That Hololens demonstration was freaking amazing. I was writing my post. I want the time. one in my living room yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> it was incredible, um, and just the voice commands. Yeah, just to be able to say, look at a pig and a lightning strike. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was awesome. I just, yeah, I, I was utterly speechless after that. I mean, I, I've been a, a massive proponent of VR and stuff for gaming yeah. for years, but this is just this was something else. And the fact it's come from Microsoft, I have to kind of like, you know, I have to give them a little bit of kudos, which yeah. I don't like doing to Microsoft because they've come up with something pretty fucking extreme there. Yeah, it's not rare. Well, it's 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 not it's not often. That Microsoft 
tend to come away victorious from an E3 conference. The last two years, Sony have just... Sony have killed it the last couple of years. Um, But this year, I think, Sony didn't come up with an answer to backwards compatibility. Definitely not. Not at this this conference, although I haven't heard anything for a while, but they did buy up Geico. And the whole idea with Geico was to have like the Netflix of PlayStation games, essentially. Um, They didn't mention anything this time round, which... But surely, was a surprise. I thought PSN was the Netflix of games, but yeah. But the whole point was they they were going to upload all the PS One, P, uh, PS Two, PS Three yeah. games to the Geico Cloud, so you could either buy them and play them fresh, yeah. or like have proof of purchase of the original and download yeah. it. And I and I thought, given Microsoft's announcement that Sony Sony would come might back come with back it. with that, yeah. but they didn't. In fact, even their their VR offering Morpheus, Morpheus. was kind of weak as well it was kind of weak but i the, the, i did see the thing in there with the, the eve online thing i can't remember what it was called now there was a an eve online thing playing in the background while they were doing the morpheus and it's it's a, it looks like a new expansion for, for okay. eve that is using this vr stuff which i don't know it may tempt you back to eve online i don't know it'll take quite a bit yeah <laughs> to actually tempt me to go back and play it again after last time but yeah, I yeah I don't I don't think that their their VR offering was anywhere near as good as the Hololens. Stuff. No, I th- well, Hololens and the fact that they've got Microsoft got Valve VR and yeah. Oculus Rift, it's just yeah. like they seem to have that pretty much covered. Especially yeah. given how Oculus Rift and Facebook uh, embed together as well. Yeah. So that was yeah it was kind of a, that was my the big shock of the conference for me was Microsoft kind of owning it. Mm. Like, oh, okay, fair enough. Well, I suppose it's been a couple of years, and it, I think in part it was because they they'd kind of moved away from demoing the Xbox One as your um, entertainment center hub. Yeah they, yeah, they they looked much more focused on gameplay and game experience this time round. I think that kind of worked for them. Yeah, well, I, th- I think they've needed to because they they have been branding it as the kind of center of your home entertainment. Yeah, to the detriment of games. And this time out, it was about the games. I think was. A, a different move for them and a smart move ultimately because mm. the only thing Sony could come up with as a counter to that was to say that Final Fantasy 7 Remake is going to be coming yeah which I'm um, not you know yeah it was a great game but I don't need it remade yeah and there was nothing else new yeah I mean, there, there are a couple of interesting new ones though uh, which will be on Sony if not by Sony yeah but the uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate <laughs> Bring it the fuck on, Victorian London <laughs> Assassin's Creed. Yeah, you've been dying for this for a while. Holy but... shit, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I cannot wait for that. They've got sword canes and stuff in it. It's going to yeah. be fucking epic. Yeah, Eve, yeah. Evie. The, the awkward moment, though, was during the Ubisoft presser when Aisha Tyler sat next to a guy who'd come cosplayed as the main protagonist of AC3 and he was pretty awkward mm. but she bossed it like normal but I love the Ubisoft press conference just because she just owns it mm. every single year um, but in terms of what they showed us at Ubisoft they've kind of just thrown out a couple of things they've already shown us Yeah, I mean The Division got yet another gameplay demo it feels like that game's been in development since E3 2013 you see I, I'm not excited about that at all. I'm losing excitement with every passing year. Um, they did say there'll be the beta date was announced, so it's either going to be Christmas this year or the start of next year. It's rolling over because at the Ubisoft conference it was Christmas, and then at the Sony conference it was the start of next year. So mm. we'll wait and see. But yeah, they have all the Tom Clancy properties because Rainbow Six Siege, again, it's one of those games which looks it looks good, but. In all honesty, you're never going to be playing that game yeah. online with a group of people who are that committed to being well, coordinated. See, F- FPS and, and third-person shooters and stuff are just not my bag, I don't yeah. think. that I don't think they have been for many, many years. No, I can see that. I, I, I'm much more into the immersive puzzle games and yeah. solving stuff. and Well, apart from Assassin's Creed, which is just awesome. I'm getting more into that kind of first person combat type of game. So I've been playing Shadows of Mo- Shadow of Mordor quite a lot 
recently, and that's really cool. I'm really yeah. enjoying that. Uh, it's a slightly older game, but uh, oh, very much enjoying that. That's cool. No. Um, so I guess other, other ones that I've got on my list are um, Star Wars Battlefront. Yeah. Again, which I said at the start of the year is going to be my thing of the year, and seeing the trailers for that, I'm just like, oh yeah, bring it, bring but it. But there's only four worlds you can play on. I don't care. One of them's Hoth, and you get to drive a fucking at at. <laughs> You get to play as Vader. Yeah, indeed. You get to play as Vader. Or um, Luke. Or Luke. There's different game gameplay styles. I kind of had to throw... I, I kind of bite my continuity tongue watching the trailer as Luke was there in in black with his one hand in black. And I was yeah. like, that can't happen. So yeah, I had to bite my inner pedant at that point. But yeah. the rest of it looks awesome. You can, you can drive an at-at. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I'll let you have that one. <laughs> or you can fl- fly a land speeder. Or you can fly Ender. a snow speeder, yeah, yeah. Or on Endor, you can be the land speeder. Yes. So, yeah, that looked pretty cool. And then, of course, there's the um, Star Wars themed Disney online Infinity CCG. 3. I want that as well, yeah. But I was thinking the card game first. All right, yeah. So it's the card game. Uh, and then, yeah. And Disney, Disney Infinity 3. 3. Star Wars. Something else to rob me of all my money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, £10 a shot for figures, is it? Crap. <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> PlayStation exclusive, they get Rise of the Empire early, and they get the Boba Fett figure. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can see a lot of my money going on these. Yeah. And then there was the other one that caught me from left field, which was uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Yeah. Because I love Mirror's Edge. They look pretty cool. Fantastic game. Cyberpunk mixed with free running. Hell yes. Yeah. So what games grabbed me? I think other than Fallout Four, For Honor looks interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so you basically get to play out those big epic movie battles, mm-hmm. movie fight scenes. Um, so it's PvP online, you with your army of AI minions against an opponent with their army of AI minions, and then you have that moment where you lock eyes across the battlefield, and then the the individual duel begins. Okay. So yeah, that looks kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the sort of long-term replay value of that game is going to be, but I think novelty initially is going to be great. Mm. And then there's No Man's Sky, which yeah. looks interesting yeah, yeah. as well. Uh, procedurally generated game, which means it's algorithms that create the, the random world rather than humans making mm. them by hand. Uh, there's the risk that it turns into the same sort of thing that uh, Wind Rider does. Mm-hmm. It's a sailing based game, like um, Sid Meier's Pirates. Yeah. Where, where you just devolve into the same sort of quest over and over again. They just change the names every now. But they have said that this universe they've created is so, so vast. Every player starts on their own planet with just the basic equipment you to survive and get into space where they can decide how they're going to play the game uh, and if they had a million players and they put them on a million different planets the universe is so big that like meeting another player online would still be a novel experience mm. which I think is cool it's nice to be part of this vast universe and make your own way again longevity and replay value are the, are the key and I'm not sure whether that's going to get tedious after a while. Yeah, I, I another one of the big ones that was was um, Batman, Arkham Knight. Arkham Knight. Now, I mean, I, I saw some of the footage for it at MCM, and it looks great. But this is so it sparked up a bit of a com- bit of a debate on Facebook the other day because I I posted about it. It's like it's fifty five quid for the normal for the basic version of the game, and it's eighty quid for the premium edition. Is that too much? Yeah. I think it is. Well, there are a lot of people going, oh, but it, you know, it takes hours, it takes a lot more to make a game and blah, blah, blah. But it's just like, well, yeah, I kind of get that. But 80 quid, it, it's a huge amount of money to spend on a game. Yeah. Um, I guess it's down to priorities, really. Because, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've spent fucking thousands of pounds on magic cards in my time. But it just feels like a huge amount of initial outlay. I think... I think that's the, just the way that 
the industry has been moving. I'm trying to think of every form of entertainment. Gig tickets have gone up. Cinema tickets have gone up. If I was to break down what I spend every month just on streaming TV, probably comes to like twenty five pounds a month mm. just to watch TV on my laptop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the price of video games has just shot up with every next gen console. Mm. It just rises, and the, the the question is, are we getting the same sort of gameplay for the yeah. price? And it's not. But I guess the point is that you don't know until you've bought the game. I guess that's what reviews are for. Yeah. It just seems a bit weird. And it, it it always seems to me at the moment like you're buying a game, you're, you're buying the promise of a game that then has a whole bunch of content, like Destiny, for example, which I bought, I played for two hours and I went, that shit, it got rid of it. And now people are like, oh, but there's all this extra downloadable content now. It's great. It was like, why wasn't that there to start with? Yeah. Well, it's the whole sort of in-game sales and mobile app approach to gaming where yeah. it's like you're just trying to print money wherever you possibly can i don't know i, I guess at the moment i'm just i'm tr- I'm, I, I'm formulating it as a problem in my mind at the moment and i haven't really come to any conclusions about it yet it just it struck me as something that was a little bit off when i thought about it for a second and went 80 quid for a game and i don't know whether it's just me being out of touch with it or not it might be because a lot of people have come back and gone, the hell yeah, I'm paying that, because it looks awesome. I'll throw it open to the audience. Well, indeed, yeah. yeah. So it, it sparked off some interesting debate the other day, which is that, that that's the reason why I raise it, yeah. is because, you know, I, I haven't quite formulated my opinion on it. I just thought my, my, my gut reaction was 80 quid was too much for a game. But a lot of people are saying, well, no, and that's, that's the premium edition of the game, so that includes a season pass and it includes a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, but I just you kind of miss the days where you go in and you'd buy a game. And I'm not saying you miss those with the cheap prices. When everything is kind of relative to the, the time in terms mm. of price. But I just miss the days where you could buy a game and you knew that... That that was that, it. That, that was it. it was you finished. bought the game, that's the whole game, yeah. that, that's it. It was the, the finished article. Yeah. There was nothing missing in there, yeah. nothing that they were going to patch later on. I guess on. it's that feeling that, yeah, there is still more to come, yeah. that it's not a complete game without those bits as i mean because I, I even brought up the thing which is for kickstarter i i mean i kickstarter delete dangerous before it came out because i'd played the original game and when it came out it was a thing yes there are patches to it going on now and they're releasing new things but they're not charging any more for it no it's just there it's the game so i don't know so my instinct as well is that 80 pounds is too much for a game but I haven't bought a game for I haven't bought a game for a long time. Well, so. Is is fifty five pounds, which is the, the the base level of it? Is that still too much, or is that acceptable? I still think that's too much. Mm. I, I See, think, I, I I think somewhere around the forty to fifty pound mark would be what I'm comfortable playing paying for a game. But they just need to start looking at their market, and I'm, well. They obviously are people are paying it. Well, yeah, yeah. But so people like, are doing it because a, a lot of people I know who are very very into games are like, fuck yeah, to absolutely paying that but do you price out a next generation of gamers who maybe don't have affluent families to be able to help them or jobs to be able to afford it themselves mm. I mean are they the ones who are buying app and mobile based games because yeah. they're cheap and affordable I who knows know. it's, uh, it's an interesting debate it and is. it's not one that yeah, it's, it's not one that I feel like I'm fully ready to tackle yet no same it's, it's, an, it's definitely an interesting research question mm. it's something to dig into because um, there's cultural theory and sociology and just rife in there for picking apart. Yeah. But mm, curious, if I had the time, I might even start forming <laughs> something. <laughs> well, there we go. I might write an Food essay. Food for thought, sir. I might write an essay on that. We'll see. Anything else for you, highlights from E3? Um, no, to be honest. As soon as Bethesda dropped the Fallout 4 um, gameplay footage, I was just like, great. And I'm kind of done. Cool. I don't really need anything else. Because that's the only reason I'm going to buy an X-Gen console is to play Fallout 4. Mm. Now, the, oh, there was an interesting thing that I saw the other day that um, E3 is becoming... Well, he's potentially looking to become less of just a press-only thing. Well, is it just press-only? I, I thought, thought it was. I E3. thought the, the panels... Or am I getting it mixed up with something else? 
I thought it was open to the public. You can go and just go around the booth and play. I didn't think it was a <clears throat> an industry only thing. I thought it was. I, I, I was under the impression it was an industry only thing, and that they were just starting to open it out to allow developers or studios to invite people to come along just to play. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was going back to the Microsoft conference. That was something. Another big takeaway from their conference was their seeming seeming devotion to the indie gaming community. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of love for indie developers, and a lot of efforts being made to, to help new indie developers, which I thought was good. That's cool. So. Sweet. Sweet. So that's thoughts on E three. Yeah, it's still going on. Um, we'll put a link to. The press conferences. Yep. In the show notes. So if you haven't already seen the beauty that is Fallout 4, you can go out and enjoy that. <laughs> Experience it for yourselves. Um, if Tom Clancy first person based shooters are your are your deal, then check out the Ubisoft conference because they've got um the division, they've got Rainbow Six Siege and they've got a new Ghost Recon coming out. Or just go and watch the Star Wars Battlefront trailer. Yeah. Because you can drive a fucking at Yeah, so that's on <laughs> that's on the electronic arts uh press conference so which is all sports games and then star wars <laughs> uh, i think there's more star wars battlefront footage at the sony conference as well yeah yeah so yeah i think at the moment yeah there's at the a survival re- mode i think in the yeah sony one at the time of recording this uh the nintendo conference and the square enix conference are happening yeah i think nintendo is on as we record yeah and so we're not covering those because we can't be in two places at once. It did. <laughs> but we'll put the videos, I'll we'll put the links to the stream videos in the, in the yep. show notes. Most definitely. Cool, cool, cool. Right, so Jurassic World, done. Uh, and Rich Park, Game of Thrones, done. Molecular, done. E3, uh, done. E3, done. Ah. So this is where we get to like look at things that. Do we have time to talk I, about I uh, about time. the Martian? We have time. Okay, because I, I like it. any excuse to call back to Mars One yep. and lunatics firing themselves into space has to be discussed, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely <laughs> does. It's been a running thing through this show. So I saw the trailer for the Martian today, and I basically thought, yeah, this is a movie that they've made ahead of Mars One about what's going to happen to them when they launch themselves into space. Yeah, I saw the trailer uh, a few, I think. Last week, sometime before I went to London, and was so impressed with the trailer, I instantly bought the book on Amazon, and I've been reading that, and it's a very good book. Basically, every chapter starts with him going, "I'm fucked," and then by the end of the chapter, he's worked out his series of problems by doing all the science, and then he goes to sleep happy. Who's the author? Um, Alan Weir, I want to say. Okay. But like, can't remember off the top of my head. That, that rings a bell. Again, we'll stick the link to it in the show notes. Yeah. We'll find it afterwards. Yes, and then every chapter finishes with him kind of solving that day's problems, going to sleep, and then waking up the next day to I'm another fucked. problem. Right. Yeah. So basically, he's trying to last four years for the next mission in a habitat that's been constructed for thirty-one days. If I'm the being... habitat's fine, the habitat isn't the issue. Um, the habitat is there and built to survive and built right. to last. The issue is the fact that he doesn't have food yeah. and water for that long. Um, so yeah. At the moment, I've got the part where he's growing potatoes. So he's doing all the he's doing all the maths and all the, the science about how many potatoes he needs to be able to grow every period of time to meet his daily nutritional yeah, needs, daily calorific intake needs. He's not too worried about vitamins. He has vitamin pills for years. Um, so yeah, he's doing all the maths and working out how to get stuff to grow on Mars, essentially. But he's a botanist, so it's okay. He's kind of perfect. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's The sense of humour throughout what I've read so far is great. Mm-hmm. It's. Do you think it's going to be reflected in the film? I don't know how they can do it in the film. Because in the trailer, you see a lot more of it's, every other character. The crew and the people back on Earth yeah, and stuff. Yeah, but the book is essentially a log. It's, it's, it's yeah. his log. So, yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to translate. It might be that I haven't got to part of the book yet where the other characters are more involved. Yeah. But at the moment, everything is just like... Just him. Yeah. Him slowly dealing with the predicament he's in mm. and doing it with a sense of humour. The humour reminds me a little bit of Ernest Cline. So, 
yeah, the Ready Player One vibe in terms of yeah. the writing style and the humour is there, which is cool because that's my favourite book. So mm. it's making it very easy to read this. But yeah, like I say, Mars One. <laughs> so this guy has watched for survival though, and I think doing that with their training video, right? we're just like, okay, guys, before we fire ourselves off into space, let's all sit and watch yeah. The Martian. Yeah, <laughs> this is what to do to science the shit out of things. Yeah, that line is great. <laughs> Gonna have to science the shit out of this. Yeah, I'm getting kind of a moon vibe from it as well in terms of the whole isolation. Yeah, a bit, yeah, 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 but, definitely, but without the weird cloniness. Yeah. Love that film. It's, it's awesome. I, yeah. I think Moon's a fantastic film. So yeah, we should get some good sci-fi this year. <coughs> yeah, hopefully so. Cool. cool, cool. But yeah, we, we have to call back to the Mars One stuff because because we, we mentioned them in the first show and yeah. we have to update you on their progress. They're still <laughs> lunatics. They're still firing themselves at Mars. They're still going to die. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. I think that's just about it. I would say that's about it, sir. Cool. Thank you all for listening. I've been Brendan. I've been Spindles. And until next time, take care and be excellent to each other.